This morning, we would like to recognize you who have served in the various branches of our military service this morning. If when I call your branch, would you please stand if you served in that branch and remain standing until all the all of the branches have been recognized army. Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, and Marines. We thank you and honor you for your service to us this day. Folks, can we uh, stand in their honor and recognition this morning? Now let's lift our voices to the one who is mighty above all, all others. What a mighty God we serve. Once there was an epitaph written on a tombstone in a graveyard, and it said, as you walk by and cast an eye, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. Someone thought about that and came back and wrote an inscription under it and said, to follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> last words. That's what that uh, demonstrates for us. It's just last words people would leave. I remember hearing of a tombstone at a church at Bexley Baptist over there in George County that the gentleman had on the back of his tombstone, the bank is closed. <laughs> In other words, children were coming to dad for <laughs> Solomon. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse seven, says the end of the matter. And when you sum up 
everything, Blake, that he said for these 12 chapters and all of this gruntledness of trying to find peace and joy and contentment in life and coming up empty everywhere he looked. He said, at the end of it all, the greatest thing I can tell you is to fear God and obey his commandments. He had found that the greatest fulfillment that he had in life was to fear God and serve him faithfully. We're talking about today a life well lived. So I'm hoping that as we wrap up this series on the cure for the summertime and really anytime blues is Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will enjoy the last service as we study that today, and it would be meaningful to you. And I hope that we walk away from Ecclesiastes knowing more about it and able to witness and help it grow our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that as we are gathered together for worship today, that you would just be glorified in everything that is sung, every prayer that is prayed, every note that is struck, and Lord, every thing that we do in this service would bring you glory and honor. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful crowd that's here. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move amongst us and that you would be praised, that we would set aside all of our distractions and we could praise you for just these few moments. Lord, really these few moments should be an overflow of what's happened throughout the course of the week as we've praised you privately. So Lord... May it all overflow right now and glory and praise for your name. We love you. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you are a visitor here for the first time, I wish that you would reach into the pool, into the pew in front of you. Hang on just a second. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to sneeze. At who? At you. All right. <laughs> I wish that you'd reach into the pew in front of you, pull out the visitor card, fill it out. I'd love to call you, text you, just to pray with you, try to encourage you. Thank you for your visit. So if you'll fill that visitor card out, we would greatly appreciate it. We'd love to have a record of your visit. If you're looking for a church home, I hope that you found it. Wonderful family right here at Union Baptist. We're so grateful to be a part of it. So welcome to our family worship service. Let's sing again, Worthy of Worship, hymn number three in your, uh, in your hymnal. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring. You are worthy, Father, create. 
This morning, we want to pray God's blessings over our Operation Christmas Child boxes here. Uh, what a great job. Look at all these wonderful boxes. Y'all just give the Lord a round of applause for the blessings here. Thank you for everyone who's given such due diligence to fill those boxes. Uh, one of our church members said, look how stuffed this box is. My husband decided that they needed a football. So they crammed the football in there. Well, bless the Lord for that. You can't imagine how these children who have, don't have a thing are going to respond with the receiving of these boxes. We were in Nicaragua riding down the road. And they didn't have anything there. And we would throw tennis balls out the van while we were riding down the road. And you should see the children chasing after those tennis balls because they don't have any toys or anything whatsoever. So this is going to be a blessing to them. But the greatest thing is they're going to hear the gospel while they're receiving it. And that's the greatest part of it all. So I want to invite you to come with me up here and let's kind of stand around the front of these boxes and let's have a time of prayer of dedication that the Lord would use these boxes, a simple gesture that he would use these to save the souls of children and parents as they receive these. So will you join with me up here? We're going to give you a few moments to pray and after you've had a few moments, I'm going to lead us in this prayer. You can touch the boxes, touch someone's shoulder. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we put our hands on these simple gifts, gifts that we hope are used to be an avenue for us to share the gospel and children and maybe even their families be saved. Lord, we have no idea of the far reaching impact of one child or one family member coming to faith in Christ and how transformational it can be for generations of that family so lord as we give these gifts and hopes that children and parents will respond in faith to be saved we're mindful of the greatest gift that was ever given and that was your son and our lord thank you for the giving of the most precious and perfect gift lord as we know and love you, I pray that they would come to know and love you. Lord, open, open their hearts to receive the messages that are going to be shared with them as they're opening these gifts. And Lord, thank you for Brother Franklin and Samaritan's Purse, a mighty tool in your hands for the sharing of the gospel. Lord, we're asking that for not only these boxes, but all boxes that are given during this season, that would be anointed by your Holy Spirit to impact the lives and the eternal security of all those who receive them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity 
to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. Thank you, Miss Sherry. What a wonderful job in singing and what a wonderful message and song to encourage us to live a life of faithfulness. I would say that that's what Solomon 
says is the greatest end of everything that he has said is just live a life of faithfulness to the Lord, a life well lived. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Would you please stand with me in reverence of reading the perfect and fallible and errant word of the living God. A verse I have often quoted right here to you in this sanctuary. Now maybe you'll understand it with more clarity as we're now at Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember also your creator and the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. <coughs> and the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few and those who look through the window grow dim. And the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. And one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and terrors on the road. An almond tree, the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and the cape berry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him, talking about the creator, before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words to write words of truth correctly. The words of the wise men are like goads and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearing to the body. Here it is. Verse 13, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act of judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Let's pray. Most gracious and holy Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would help me to communicate it with power of the Holy Spirit. The, anu the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, for this wonderful crowd that is before you this morning, Lord, I know that you have a very special word for every one of them. Lord, I don't believe we're here by accident. I believe the ones that you have here are here today for the express purpose of worshiping you and then hearing from your holy throne. Lord, we're praying for openness. I pray that my mouth could be opened to speak the glories of God. May you forgive my sin, remove my weaknesses and my frailties, and Lord, help me to speak with power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for openness, that you would open the eyes of their heart, that they could hear, perceive, and understand. And Lord, that you would reach inside their heart and do something amazing to save their soul or bring them closer to you. Lord, we praise you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Solomon says here, 
at the end of everything I have said and studied and done, the greatest thing I could tell you is just live a life of faithfulness and fear to God. And that would be the greatest thing you can do in all of your life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope to convince you this morning that living a life of faithfulness to the Lord is worth everything you can do to attain it. And I'm hoping to convince you that you should give your heart to Jesus Christ. Hopefully you'll do it when you're younger and not when you get older. Hopefully you will live a long life of faithfulness to the Lord to bring glory and honor to him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I read that NASA once launched a probe into space in 1972. How many of y'all were working for NASA in 1972? Because a lot of NASA, you weren't Bradley. <laughs> 1972, Pioneer 10 was launched into space. And it was a probe sent with a mission to go to Jupiter and send back pictures and all sorts of other data. 1973, November 73, it accomplished its mission. But in going past Jupiter, the gravitational pull of Jupiter slung it even further out into space. And at one billion miles, it passed Saturn. It continued on at two billion miles, it passed Uranus. 3 billion Pluto. Ultimately, it went way out into space, sending back pictures. And even as late as 1997, it was still sending back from 6 billion miles away information to Earth. All with the power mark of an 8 watt transmitter. The last communication was heard from Pioneer 10 on January the 30th, 2003, 32 years after it had been launched into space. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That it went far past anything NASA had ever intended for it to do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that your view of yourself may be small and limited. You may think you are weak. You may think you are frail. You may think that you're not worth much and may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. You may feel like me. I feel like it takes me two hours to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> I'm a little slow, but I'll get there. But boy, if you live your life and fear and reverence of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no telling the far reaching effects of your life long service to Jesus and what it can do in the life of your children, your grandchildren, your family, this church. Ladies and gentlemen, don't discount what God can do with a life well lived. How do you live a life well. Solomon gives us several things that we need to do. First of all, he's telling us that we need to be saved and to come to faith in Jesus Christ. He says it in verse one. Do you see it there? Look in verse one. It says, remember your creator. That word remember doesn't mean that you've forgotten him. It's not used in that sense. It's used to encourage you to give mental assent and to acknowledge that he is and that he will reward you if you seek him out. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this brings a very important question. And point number one. If Solomon is telling us to live a life of faith 
and to fear the Lord, the first question I would ask is, who can be saved? He's telling us to remember our creator in the days of our youth. So it brings to the question, can, who can be saved? And really it spawns even a couple of more questions. And very quickly, though these points are simplistic, they wade off into some very deep water. For instance, the first question is, under who can be saved, can a person be too young to be saved? Don't answer. But how many of you think a person can be too young to be saved? How many of you think even a young person can be saved? I'm going to tell you, Brother Ladonis, a person can be too young to be saved. There are some denominations who baptize children. I mean, let me back up. Babies. They sprinkle babies when they're born. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's one thing I can stand here flat footed, eyeball to eyeball, and tell you unequivocally that someone must have faith in Jesus Christ before they can be saved and baptized. Yes, children, some of them can be too young to be saved. Little bitty babies. But let me ask you this. How old is old enough to be saved? I mean, we really, we really put a lot of emphasis on a lot of things that really doesn't matter whenever it comes to this thought of who can be saved. For instance, I've had parents tell me that they felt like their children were too young to be saved. Well, can I tell you something? I understand that children don't understand the doctrine of regeneration and the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, all right? But you listen to me. Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. If that child understands that he or she is a sinner and Jesus died and was resurrected again to save them from their sin, listen. That is enough. They can spend the rest of their life trying to figure out what it is that is involved in being a disciple and what it is to, that Jesus did and all of the wonderful things that you have spent your life now trying to learn. We call it the age of accountability. How many of you have ever heard of the age of accountability? Never heard of it? It's this idea that there's a certain age that children can reach and then they can be saved. What is the age of accountability? Where did that come from? Well, let's look at Isaiah chapter 7 and it'll tell us. Isaiah chapter 7. Remember... This passage is talking about Jesus. This is a messianic passage. That's why it's capitalized. He will eat curds and honey at the time. He knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Now this passage is talking about Jesus' childhood and his ultimate birth and his coming. We take this verse to mean that there are some children who don't know right and wrong, but when they reach a certain age, they know right and wrong. And from that point forward, they need to be saved. Until then, they're covered by the common grace of Jesus Christ. Now y'all don't check out on me. There's no age in which the age of accountability starts, it's different with everybody that comes along. But at the end of the day, let me just say this, that a child, all they need to be saved is to know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and he resurrected from the grave and that is enough. The thief on the cross, uh, 
We watched the video not too long ago. The thief on the cross didn't know all of these different doctrines. He wasn't sure about the indwelling of Christ and he wasn't sure about that doctrine of biblical authority, but the man on the middle cross, he said, told him he could come. And that's all the people need. Solomon, excuse me, Solomon, Samuel was five years old when he got called to be a prophet. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says a person was a certain age when they came to faith. We see examples of children and we see examples of aged people and everybody in between. Who can be saved? Can a young people, young person be saved? Yes. <clears throat> Abigail. Maybe when she got saved, I didn't do a good enough job, Kyle, at making sure she understood everything. She was, I don't know, six, seven, eight, something like that. And she gave her heart to Jesus. And we planned her baptism. She walks down in the baptismal waters. And as she's walking down, I'll kind of demonstrate for you. She's walking down into the water and she gets there to the big open window. She looks at the congregation and she goes. <laughs> and she comes on down. She turns around. We baptize her. Later on that evening, we're at home. Church is over with for the day. And my sweet little girl comes and sits on my lap. And she's smiling. And all of a sudden, Brother Billy, she asked a question that pierced me to the heart. She said, Daddy, when am I going to die? I said, honey, I don't know. Why do you ask? She said, well, I thought I got saved and baptized so that I could go to heaven. And in her little six-year-old mind, she thought that getting saved and baptized was meaning she was fixing to leave mama and daddy and go on to heaven. And she chose to be saved anyway. I didn't do that good a job at explaining it evidently. But it just blessed my heart to know that even though that's what she thought was going to happen, she was willing to do it. That's how much faith she had in Jesus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to encourage you that the Lord can speak to any little child that he wants to. And I would much rather for a child to make a profession of faith and later on in life say they didn't understand everything. and want to make sure they understand it than for them to be told no and never do it at all. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Yes, some children are too young to be saved, but children can be saved. And you may be a little boy or a little girl in here this morning, and you've been hearing the gospel, and you've been in Sunday school, and your mom and your grandparents and your dad, they've been telling you, and this morning you may want to ask Jesus into your heart. Can a person be too old to be saved? No, I have watched videos and seen testimonies where people 99 years old were saved and baptized. Joe Havens was a member at Shady Grove Baptist Church. We're told to remember our creator in the days of our youth before the evil days come, before we get older. Joe Havens was in his 60s, late 50s, early 60s. I had went down to a little mechanic shop, made friends with some guys, fried some catfish for them for lunch. Chris Burns and his family started attending church with us because he was a mechanic there. Next thing you know, his whole family is attending and one of them, his father-in-law, Joe Havens, comes, he hears the gospel and at 60 years old, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And we baptized Joe. And in the words of Ronnie Millsap, what a difference you've made in my life. By the way, that song was by Amy Grant. It was a Christian song first. 
And Joe came up to me after he was baptized. He said, Brother Bruce, I don't know why I waited so long. I wish I would have gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ a long time ago, because this is just so good. No, a person can't be too old to be saved, but I can tell you this, are you listening? If you're listening, say amen. Amen. Well, if you didn't say amen, I know you're not listening. A person can't be too old to be saved, but it's harder for an old person to be saved. That's why Solomon says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days come and you say, I have no pleasure in them. Before you get cynical and hard hearted. How many of you know that if you're any age, there comes some times in your life where you just get hard hearted towards mankind, towards people because they can cause you to be cynical and hard hearted. Am I the only one that knows people can get cynical and hard hearted older in life. It's easier to come to faith in Christ while you're a young person. As a matter of fact, statistically speaking, 64% of all Christians come to faith in Christ before they are 18 years of age. Statistically speaking, 94% come to faith in Christ before the age of 30. Now listen, that means if you wait till after 18 or 30, the chances and the likelihood of you ever making a profession of faith in Jesus goes down exponentially. Watch this. How many of you in this room were saved before you were 18 years old. Raise your hand. Look around in the room. Keep your hands up. All right, put your hands down. How many of you were saved after 18 years of age? Still a fair amount. How many of you saved after 30 years of age? Do you see that? Five, six, and a room of 250 or so more. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a young person and the Lord is dealing with you to be saved, don't wait. Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ now. If you are a young adult and you feel the Lord leading you to be saved, give your heart and life to Jesus Christ now because there's still a chance for you to be saved. If you're older and you're older than 30 years of age and you're feeling the Lord Jesus Christ touching your heart, wow, because usually people don't get saved much after that. And so you had better give your heart to Jesus now while he can. I wanna share a verse of scripture with you. Isaiah 55 verse six, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Now, if it says, seek the Lord while while he may be found, what does that tell you? That that means just by natural, natural understanding, if you must seek the Lord while he may be found, there could be a time where he may not be found. If there is a time when the Lord is near and you're supposed to seek him while he is near, that means there is a time where he is not near. What I'm trying to put it to you big, plain and straight right here is if the Lord Jesus Christ is touching your heart, don't put him off because you can't say whether you're ever going to get another chance or not, whether you're seven years old or 70 years old, you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ when he calls you, not when you want to come. No, a person cannot be too old to be saved, but it can be too late for them to be saved. I want to show you one more passage before we move on. Romans 1, 24 through 28. 
Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the, create, the, cre, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Now, this is a passage on sexuality and homosexuality. But the point that I'm wanting to make is that three times here in these few verses, it is said that God gave them over, God gave them over, and God gave them up, implying that there is a time that it is too late for you to be saved. We have this mentality that we can come to faith anytime we want to, but that is wrong. Jesus said in John, 40, John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if the Lord is drawing you at seven or if the Lord is drawing you at 70, you come when he calls. So who can be saved? Can someone be too bad to be saved? No. There is grace that is greater than all of our sin. The second thing I want you to see is not only who should be saved, but when should they be saved? We've already established that young people can be saved and we've established that old people can be saved, but Solomon is saying that it's better to be saved when you are young, not only because of the hard heartedness that develops in individuals as they get older. But then here's the best part. You've got a longer life to serve Jesus and be rewarded. There's an old song we sing, Brother Anthony, you've heard it. Sweeter as the days go by, sweeter as the moments fly. It is sweeter to serve Jesus. And there's many songs in our hymnal that talk about how sweet it is to trust in Jesus. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, why would someone want to live a life of, of failure, of sin, and not come to faith in Christ when they could be rewarded and could be having a life of purpose? What I'm trying to tell you is it's better to get saved when you're younger. But that doesn't mean older people can't be saved. You should come to faith in Jesus when he calls. One last thing. Why should you be saved? And the last few verses here. By the way, let me go ahead and say this. Let me take my coat off. Verses two through eight talk about someone getting older. As we read through this, you see it talking about things like uh, the grinders stand still. How many of you know what it, the grinders are? Any idea? It's your teeth. The grind is he's describing in these six verses the natural aging process of a human being. It says that the grinders slow down and they are few. I remember my mother-in-law one day, she was at the house, she has dentures and she woke up, she's up there in the kitchen fixing her coffee. She says, I need to go brush my teeth. I say, give them here, Ma, I'll go do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And then he says, and another, another analogy that he uses, he says that people are afraid of terrors on the street. When you get older, you seem to trip and fall a lot. Have you ever noticed that when you get older? You seem to be off balance more. And whenever you're older, you start falling, you can start breaking stuff. And that's why they're afraid of terrors on the street. And then it goes on to say, and men are terrified of high places. How many of you would still love to get up on top of your house at the age of 70 years old and roof your house? Well, well it just doesn't happen. There was one group at Shady Grove, Brother Anthony. There was a man 90 years old that he was going to roof his own house. So the young men of the church, these were 70 years old, <laughs> said, we can't let him get up there and do that. We need to take care of that for him. So a bunch of 70 year old men get up there on top of his house and they throw ropes over the house, no joke, and tie them off to vehicles on the other side so that they can roof his house. Brother Garcia Edmonds' house. Those men had no business being on top of that house. Amen. What we're seeing here is Solomon describing the natural aging process. The almond blossom is white is what it said. How many of you have hair that is growing white? Let me tell you, when you get older, your hair quits growing on top of your head. It starts growing underground and comes out your ears and your nose. I'm standing there, Brother Terry, good to see you in church this morning. I'm standing there talking with Abigail one time, and we're in conversation, and I'm just talking, sharing something with her, and I just noticed Miss Kim out of the corner of my eye, she starts reaching real slowly towards my head. All of a sudden, she grabs something on my ear and goes, Doink! and I'm like, yeah! The hair growing out your ears and your nose, don't laugh, men, it happens to us too. <laughs> no. Now, I'm being kind of humoristic, but reality, Solomon's describing the aging process. And then he gets to the end. And he says, and then the mourners go about in the street and the dust of your body returns to the dust and the spirit returns to God who gave it. What's he describing here? The day of your death. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Solomon is telling us at the end of the day, it is better for you to be saved while you're young because you're gonna get old, you're gonna get cynical, it's going to be harder for you to be saved. And then if you wait till you get older, you can do some things for the Lord, but it would have been much better to serve him all of your life instead of just a few measly years at the end. A life well lived. Why should you be saved? He says at the very end, fear him out of reverence out of respect knowing that he Jesus Christ left heaven came to earth died on the cross for your sins so that you could be saved you fear him you serve him you get saved because you recognize and you are appreciative of his act of dying on the cross in your place. It's gratitude. But at the same time, it's out of fear and reverence for his name. 
recognizing that if you don't give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, when your body returns to the dust and your soul returns to God who gave it, you will be accountable for your sins. He says that at the very end, live your life well and obedient because judgment day is coming. And when you stand before God, you don't want to hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you. Can I just be honest with you? Hell is a real place. Some people will try to tell you that hell is not real. I'm telling you, hell is real. You know why I say it so confidently? Because Jesus said it was real. He said, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cast that wicked servant into outer darkness where the worm never dies. The lake of fire that burneth forever and ever that was prepared for the devil and the false prophet. Nowhere in scripture is hell ever spoken of in a positive light. The worst thing about hell is the absence of God. No hope, no joy, no peace, only punishment for eternity. My father-in-law once preached a message, Brother Billy, the title, Hell is Hell. And it is. Hell is a real place. My question is, do you know where you're going to go? One of my favorite paintings that I've heard about and seen pictures of was painted by Paul Morphy Jr. Now, how many of you in here play chess? Anybody play chess? One or two? Paul Morphy Jr. was a world champion chess player from New Orleans around 1900. He went into an art gallery and he saw a painting by one of these French dudes that I can't pronounce his name. I'm going to just call him Bob. It, was Rem, it wasn't Rembrandt, but something like that. The picture was of the devil and this young man playing chess. And the young man is playing the devil and whoever wins the match then if it's the devil, he gets the young man's soul. If the young man wins, then he gets to keep his soul and earn his freedom. And the painting is of the young man jumping up in surprise, realizing that the devil had him in checkmate and he's just lost his soul. Paul Morphy Jr., world champion chess player, walks in to that art gallery, sees that painting and studies it for a while, and then Jeffrey, he called for a chess board and some pieces. And they arranged them just like they were on the painting. Paul Morphy studies the painting and he looks at the board. Studies the painting, looks at the board. All of a sudden, Paul Morphy says, I will make the move that the young man should have made. And with one move, removes himself from checkmate and puts the devil in checkmate. You see, the thing was, the artist who painted it was not a chess player. Paul Morphy was a master chess player and he knew the move that had to be made to win the game. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the master. And he made the only move that could be made to save us from our sin and from an eternal hell with the devil. Amen. Now, will you allow the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? Whether you're six or 86. I want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ. To live a life well lived. So that you will experience what Solomon told us we could experience. With everyone standing, please bow your head and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, <clears throat> I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that I have said it 
effectively, where I have failed and fallen short, I pray that you would just let your Holy Spirit speak into the hearts of your people. May your Holy Spirit excel while I fall, where I fall short. Lord, I'm praying that somehow the things that have been said has impacted the hearts of people. Lord, that some of them here would be saved, <clears throat> that they would give their heart to you. Lord, I believe maybe they've been feeling you touching their heart. That you've been calling them to salvation. And Lord, I ask that they would respond this morning. My weaknesses, my frailty are insignificant. The power of your Holy Spirit will prevail. So Lord, I'm asking that they would be saved this morning. Dear ma'am or dear sir, I know well the words of Adrian Rogers who said, many people can preach the gospel better than I can, but nobody can preach a, go a better gospel than I can. I understand that. There's many who can proclaim it better, but there's no one who could proclaim a better gospel. So this morning, if you would like to be saved, I invite you to pray this way with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you're the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose victorious over the grave. Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart. Pray that from your heart, please. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save my soul, and I will follow you the rest of my life. I'm turning loose this morning and yielding all I have to you. Save me, Jesus. Fill my heart with your Holy Spirit, and I'll follow you the rest of my life. Thank you for loving me so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to start the invitation. And sometimes the devil loves to perch on your shoulder during that invitation. And he'll tell you things like you've done too much wrong to be saved. Well, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. He'll tell you you can do it later. Well, I told you this morning, you've got to come when the Lord's calling you. He'll try to convince you not to do it in front of this big crowd of witnesses. But Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. But if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my father. And he'll perch there on your shoulder and he'll give you every reason not to make your decision public. But ladies and gentlemen, don't listen to him. If the Lord's calling you to salvation, you come this morning and you come and take me by the hand. You don't have to say anything to anybody. You don't have to say anything to me. Just take my hand. I'll know. And I'll guide you and pray with you in your new walk with Christ. You just come and be obedient. Let go and let God is what we say. Heavenly Father, maybe some of them need to give their heart to you this morning. They've prayed. Now they need to make it public. And I imagine right now the battle may be going. Lord, please help them to hear your voice. Lord, some of them may need to join membership here at Union. Lord, help them to know for sure what you're wanting them to do and not to try to reason everything out, but if you're calling them, just let them come. And then Lord, some of them may, may need to rededicate their life to you. Come pray over some issue that's going on. Father, we give this invitation to you to accomplish what you desire. In Christ's name, amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light.
Amen.